Hi, everybody. Would you like me to do the shh? Everyone who can hear the shh, please repeat it with me. Shh. I think we can do louder than that. I heard you all back there. Once again, shh. It's also good to exhale. Breathe in. And then, shh. Okay, can we please have everybody back on the tables? Um, we are coming to a close. We have about two sessions remaining. And it will be great if we can have your attention, because these are very important and interesting sessions, if I can uh, say that myself. Um, so we've just decided to switch the voice a little bit, because you all were not listening to Vishal. So I hope you will listen to me now. Um, so I am usually the person who is writing behind the scenes and doing a lot of the research products that you see out here. So I wanted to, oh, thank you. I mean, I didn't, I, why? Print our knowledge products. And um, we wanted to actually show you a video, but seeing that you are all having such a good time interacting with each other and bonding over coffee, we decided to skip the video and leave it on our website for you. So request you to please scan the QR code, go to the resources section, check out the video. Along with the video, we also have a, a lineup of stories from different gender identities across India. Um, in recent times, I've heard that nobody reads, so we've tried to keep it extremely brief with very little text, I promise you. Um, so please enjoy our um, Taking Center Stage, which covers stories from all across India. And you will also see that we have an equity snakes and ladders here to remind you a little bit of uh, childhood. Um, I hear that in the US it's called shoots and ladders, so uh, please enjoy the knowledge products and go through them. Um, with that, we come to our next session, which is titled All Work and Low Pay. Um, yes, as you can see, we really love the play on words. Um, so before I begin, I would do one last show, and I would say, please join me in doing that, because I still see people at the back. Is it working? OK, fine. I tried. I'm going to go into the panel now. Um, so can NGOs and businesses work together towards worker well-being? What does convergence of business and human rights look like in action? We will touch upon some of these questions in the next 30 minutes. I hope you're excited. Let me begin by introducing the panel and calling them to the stage. Uh, we have with us Andrew Kasoy, who is the CEO and co-founder of B-Lab Global, a non-profit network geared towards transforming economic systems and corporate structures. Since its inception in 2006, Andrew has been able to support businesses across the world via policies, tools, programs that enable meaningful legal change, corporate accountability, and social impact. Andrew, please come on the stage. Thank you. Um, Next, we have a vacant seat, but we, we pre-recorded this video from Divya Verma, who is the director um, at the Center for Migration and Labor Solutions, the team that anchors knowledge and policy work with Ajivika Bureau, an organization immersed in building equity and dignity for laboring communities in India. Divya leads Ajivika Bureau's policy and partnerships work, engaging with a range of stakeholders from industry to government. And then we have Kathy Seabrook, who is the founder and CEO of Global Solutions Inc. that helps companies structure sustainable business strategies in the environmental safety and health risk space. Having wide ranging sector expertise in global environment, health and safety management, Kathy has donned several roles as a management consultant, international keynote speaker, strategic planning facilitator, leadership coach, published author, and now a DPF panel member. Please. And then we have um, 
Liz Diebold, who is the Managing Director of Portfolio and Investments at the School Foundation, where she leads the art and science of a responsible and equitable investment practice for social change to advance solutions for critical development challenges. Her work is focused on developing markets, digital financial inclusion, fund structuring and supply chain investments facilitation for small local firms and multinational corporations. Liz, we welcome you too. Okay, so India's majority labor force remains missing in our development story. Over 90% of our workforce is informally employed. The workers build our homes and cities, manufacture goods and provide daily services. The hard work of these workers ensure that many of us in this room even live comfortably. Yet they have remained invisible because of systemic barriers and our collective apathy. However, something shifted in our minds and hearts during the pandemic. When India went into lockdown at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, millions of workers were left stranded without basic supplies and under fear. The images of the media coverage of seeing so many of them walking on foot over thousands of miles is a memory that will remain with us forever. And in this moment of darkness, there was also a little bit of positive momentum. Business leaders wanted to do something about we worker well-being and with the support of local non-profits. Adversaries turned into partners. The lucidness of the struggle, the inequalities nudged action. Um, with equity and inclusion at the center of the approach, we began a journey of co-solutioning. Companies brought their systems thinking mindset to create scalable change and NGOs provided instances of strong practice through human centric design. Um, the wheels were set in motion. So with that, let's tune in to some of what's happening all around the world. Um, Liz, since you work towards supporting social innovations that create more inclusive economies, I would like to ask you, what is the ideal aspiration for worker well-being? Thank you for the question. And after hearing that beautiful opening, I feel like I want to read everything you've ever written. So <laughs> do scan the codes. Um, no, hi, everyone. I, I think that first and foremost, we should acknowledge that um, it, what's the, sorry, what's the question is, what's the definition of, the, of a well-being for a worker? Yeah. So it, it's personal, right? So there's sort of, there's universal truths for certain. Um, I think basic dignity, human dignity is extremely important, but it's particularly since we're talking about informal workers, um, I'm going to put everyone on the spot, like raise your hand if you've ever been an informal worker in your life. Okay, so then I want to hear from you. I, I have myself as well and my parents, um, my parents did as well. Um, and I think that you, you know, ideally, what work can give you is an opportunity to contribute some of your special talents and, and the value that you have to offer um, to the world. So that's my personal, like that's my goal. I want to deliver some sort of purpose through my work. Um, I want my work to be life giving um, as opposed to sort of life taking, um, which again, I think to a lot of people that might mean different things. To me, that means I need time outside of work to enjoy life and to do things other than my livelihood. Um, but then I also need sufficient income from my, from my work in order to, um, to support that life. Um, and for me, again, I would, I would the, the last thing that really comes to my mind is wanting to be sort of free from fear of harm from that work that I would be doing. So no threats to my, to my safety, um, to my security. Um, and so, right, so I, I share that personally because again, like I think it, we would all sort of have maybe a different, a different solution there or a different answer. Um, and yet, I work for the School Foundation and manage our um, inclusive economies strategy and, and program area. And so we have to try to bubble it up and think about, okay, how, what does this mean on a, on a broader, broader level? And, 
in a more universal way. Um, and what we've sort of pinpointed with our strategy is looking towards um, driving, the, driving the economic system towards more of a stakeholder capitalism version um, of, of capitalism. And through that, we're looking to um, support solutions that are changing business practices in very actionable and tangible ways. Um, and there are several sort of priority lenses that we, that we apply to that because the way you do that work, how you do it, what you consider, what it means, who you define as your stakeholders, um, and how you even know what they need really matters. Um, and so one of our underpinnings of, of our work is um, sort of a, the notion of nothing, nothing for us without us. Um, so we're looking for partners who are be able to collaborate with businesses, with the corporate sector, with, with even small businesses um, around the world who are prioritizing a listening um, of their workforce and understanding of their needs. You have to, so you, you must ask. Again, like start with the same question, like what is it that you need to be, at, to have well-being in this workplace? And again, it might slightly, slightly change, but if you don't, if you don't center those voices, then we're just going to potentially keep perpetuating notions of bias or our limited, you know, purviews because we don't all know everything about everyone in the world. So that's, I know that's a lot of generalities. I'm happy to get into more details, but I think we're post, post break towards the end of the day and a bit rushed. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Liz, for humanizing that for us um, because we often talk about shifting systems and improving institutional practice, but I think at the core of it is a human being um, who has needs like all of us do. And I think you really brought that um, point really well. Um, would you like to talk a little bit more about um, what, how you see inclusive economies and if you would like to explain that to us, we'll be happy to listen to you. Well, again, so I think we're we're focused on on driving shifting the the system towards a more stakeholder version of capitalism. So um, we'd love to see a world, and we actually stole this definition. Will sound very familiar to you, Andrew, because we we I don't like to make up work that's not necessarily n necessary to be done if others have done the work. Um, so we define that as an economic system where businesses prioritize and consider their impact on all stakeholders, workers customers, communities, and the environment. Um, straight off your website, I think. <laughs> um, and again, so uh, among other, so sorry, in addition to the nothing for us without us notion of how you bring that to life, um, we're also looking for solutions that are prioritizing a shift to long-termism. Um, as opposed to short-termism. So again, the, the way you account for stakeholders and what that means and the journey that you're looking to go to really matters. Um, and I actually think like the, probably the most important sort of parameter that we, that we try to apply to our own work and the solutions that we support um, is that we're looking for partners who really believe that the economic system not only can, but should be able to deliver well-being um, I, I don't think it's that complicated or controversial, but um, it's amazing the kinds of conversations I can find myself in there. Um, and so I know I think someone else is going to speak about social compact, but this is one of the examples of these solutions that we're looking to support. So um, we just, I mean, I probably, I don't know, a couple weeks ago signed on the dotted line to, um, to provide some funding support um, for this multi-stakeholder um, collaboration. I kind of want to put people on the spot. Who, is, does anybody is anyone left in the room who works on social compact? Technically, <laughs> exactly. Um, so again, it, like these aren't our solutions. This isn't like the school foundation program. Um, we're looking for solutions that are working that are that are already out there. Um, so I, being in the room with you, I don't want to speak to to the work. You've seen the hands now. Um, but it's one of the most exciting things um, that, that we've seen um, out there. So again, I'll stop there because you've got the solution, we just get to support it. Thank you for that um, support, encouragement, and enabling us to continue doing our work well. Um, and uh, 
for bringing up these points with regard to making uh, economies more stakeholder accountable and also bringing in an approach with factors in the long term. Um, with that, um, let me move on to you, um, Cathy. Uh, the work that you do is actually looking at expanding the definition of capital to mean more than monetary capital. And I think that's very well linked to what Liz was also talking about. Um, because people are at the core of every thriving business. And you focus on this through instruments and frameworks that change policy and practice. Um, could you share with us why we need such frameworks to focus on social and human capital? And uh, you could also talk to us about your experience of applying these in the context of worker well-being. Okay, and I have four minutes to do this. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so today, I mean, my company is Global Solutions, Inc., but I'm here representing the Capitals Coalition. And what we are trying to do is transform decision-making. So everything else kind of falls in line with decision-making because everyone, whether you're in government, finance, whether you're a worker, deciding whether to work or whether to do it safely, or you're dealing with psychological risks, psychosocial risks, psychological, psychological health and safety at work, um, you're making a decision. And so what we at the Capitals Coalition are trying to do is transform decision-making by actually including the value of people, of society, and nature in all of the decision-making. Now, that might sound sort of like this, but it's actually working. And before I finish, I will tell you a company, I'm going to point you in their direction to Google them, um, that is actually doing this. Um, the idea is that, and we are so aligned, we, we met a little bit earlier, um, the concept of stakeholder capitalism, um, the U.S. Business Roundtable uh, in 2019 basically came together to say that a purpose of a company is no longer just for shareholders, but it's opening up to stakeholders. And what this means for the topic at hand, uh, Amy, is that this is about employees and it's about workers as well. They are all part of that stakeholder group. So from my perspective today, I'm all about bridge building and I'm all about connecting the dots. Anyone that would know me would know that that's how I think and breaking down silos. And I've met some amazing people here just today in a very short period of time that just demonstrated to me again that we are all interconnected, whether you're in business, finance, you're a foundation, um, you are uh, working boots on the ground, um, working for um, sight and eyesight. I've met some folks from, from that world. Um, the, the people, the woman that spoke to us about the, uh, the health of children and maternities, I mean, all of that's boots on the ground. It's all interconnected. So what I want to do is bring this back and talk about why frameworks are important. And um, at the Capitals Coalition, we've developed a protocol Actually, I've been told by the end of December, we're going to have, um, and hopefully you guys will comment on this, guys and gals, um, will comment on our protocol that really talks about social, human capital, and natural capital, and the value they provide for a company. So to answer Amy's point, companies typically in the past have always looked at financial capital, but there are other capitals to be considered. And that's kind of what all of us together in this room are talking about. So this, um, we, we've set out two separate protocols and we are um, going to be publishing hopefully first quarter of next year, an integrated capitals protocol. And what I want to leave you with are two things. One, it's not just about impacts that a company has on all those capitals, so people, planet, um, and society, but it's also companies starting to look at, and they don't do this now, I mean, I work with corporates, that's my world, um, is to look at the dependencies they have on people, and we just saw that with the pandemic that just came through, we're seeing that with the labor shortages around the world and disruptions in supply chains, um, but also the dependency company has, companies have on nature. So basic things like water, for manufacturing, water, for people to drink, right? Especially if you're talking about arid and hot climates um, and the health and safety of people as they are working. Um, and then finally, economics and economic development and quality of life. All of these things are all interconnected and those dependencies that companies have on nature, 
on people and the society and communities that provide all that for them are what we are really advocating for companies to really start looking at. They call it impact pathways and it's all in this protocol. And again, I think I'm way over time. Um, but I wanna tell you about a company called Natura. Natura, anyone heard of um, Avon Company or um, The Body Shop, right? You've heard of, many of you have heard of that. Well, they own both. Um, and they are Brazilian-based multinational companies. They are in, um, throughout the world. And what they've done is they've taken uh, this impact pathway concept in the protocols, the social and human capital and natural protocols, and they have actually done accounting for value. And this is so important because they've published an integrated proper, uh, pro uh, profit and loss report, first time ever, um, 2022, so it was just published recently. Google that, Natura, N-A-T-U-R-A, I, P, and L, and you will get the actual report. And it goes through and it identifies these additional capitals, not just financial. And it's this accounting for value. And it's this, this concept of looking at those capitals and the actual value that is provided by people, by nature, and by society. So with that, I will pass that back to you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Kathy. And as they say, acknowledgement is the first step. So I feel that when companies start accounting for these different kinds of capitals is when they will realize that there's actually a lot of work to be done. Um, so we've touched a little bit upon the why and what of why it's important to invest in worker well-being. Um, let's go a bit deeper to understand the, <coughs> sorry, the how and so what um, of when business and human rights converge. Um, yeah, so let's go into the how and so what of when business and human rights converge. Um, let's try to see what are the transformative models that exist in the world. And um, we'll try to cover solutions from India as well as um, the North um, by understanding what the B Corps model is about. If I can just ask my team um, if they have the video ready. Um, so while they get the video ready, maybe we can hear from um, Andrew about the B Corps model. Um, would you like to talk to us about the solution that you have? Sure, happy to, and th thanks for having me here. Um, I'm glad you started with uh, by talking about COVID and worker well-being. I mean, I think one of the most important things that came out of COVID uh, was this sense that particularly for precarious and informal sector workers, that um, we don't have an economic system that looks out for them. And that might have been well known in many emerging markets. I think lots of people uh, in a country like the US uh, just sort of assumed that, um, that workers are much better off. And what we saw at the beginning of COVID um, was uh, a real reaction to the fact that um, that that workers even here um, live in incredibly precarious situations, um, and I think there's been a really important reaction to that. And so um, I, I work at an organization called B Lab. We were started about 16 years ago, and the idea was um, economic systems change. That we need to build an economic system that uh, that creates dignity for workers, um, uh, restores the environment, rebuilds local living. Uh, economies and communities, um, and that that's, uh, that that's necessary worldwide, and it's necessary because we've basically created an economic system that focuses mostly on financial return for shareholders, and that's driving environmental damage, and it's, via, it's, it's, it's um, driving less security for workers and more inequality. Um, and at the same time, business is an incredibly powerful engine that, if run right, um, actually can create extraordinary opportunities. And so um, when we started, we created a certification because we wanted to have called a B Corp. And we did that because we wanted to have like a really concrete way of defining like what is a responsible, sustainable business look like. 
And, um, and that's been a very long journey to try to figure out like what does that really look like and how it looks different in different markets around the world. Um, to start, we created a set of standards um, that we sort of like made up on a spreadsheet like about how a business would treat its workers, the commun its communities, and the environment. Um, and we really quickly realized that we had gotten everything wrong. Um, and so uh, uh, over time, as we've like iterated on that model, we've come up with a really extensive impact assessment that a business goes through. Um, and in, in addition to having um, some minimum performance standards in that impact assessment, they also have to be totally transparent about uh, how they do. Um, and they have to make a change in their governing documents so that they actually change their fiduciary duties so that they're responsible to create value for all of their stakeholders, not just their shareholders. And today, um, there are about uh, nearly 6,000 companies that have gotten certified as B Corps. They're in 84 countries around the world. Um, I think there are, uh, there are only about seven uh, B Corps in India, um, but another 150 or so that have um, pretty extensive operations in India, even if they're not um, based there. W one thing I'll just um, add is that, um, you know, it's particularly hard to think about uh, and assess uh, the way a business treats its workers um, differently than things like the environment because of the way um, we classify workers. So most reporting on social impact of business is companies reporting to you on uh, the, comp the, the employees that actually work for them and usually full time. But if you think about it, most of the impact of a business on workers is actually uh, um, part-time workers and contract workers, uh, informal workers, companies, uh, people that work for uh, companies where work has been outsourced, like the people who clean this building, likely don't uh, necessarily work for the businesses in the building. They work for a, an outsourced contractor, usually. And so you have to try to look through all of that. And then there's the supply chain. Uh, uh, and so one of the things that we've learned over time is how to get ever better at trying to make sure that as we're scoping how we're assessing a business, that we're really thinking about all of that. And we're asking companies questions about all of those different kinds of workers and then driving them to improve their impact on those different kinds of workers. And, and that's everything from what kind of wages they're making to how uh, much uh, voice and power they have in the operations of the business. Uh, whether they're able to organize if they want to, um, what kinds of ratios there are of um, highly paid workers to low paid workers so that we can get at inequality, um, and many other measures. But, but the important thing, I think, is, to, um, is that those standards need to continue to evolve and they need to exist in the context of, um, of how business is done in different countries in order to make sure that we're really getting at the sort of like the root causes of, um, of inequality and the challenges that um, uh, precarious and informal sector workers face. Um, thank you for sharing that with us, Andrew. Um, and it's great to learn that the programs and tools that you have created actually help companies reflect and create better worker practices. Um, and I know that you have also included several multinationals um, under the B Corps strategy, and I think it's incredible um, to be able to do that because at the end of those supply chains is where the maximum exploitation is. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, would you like to add something to that? Well, only that, like, I think that becomes particular. When we started, we were mostly focused on small businesses, and so some of those issues were not as important. As more large companies um, want to be certified as B Corps or engage with this community, it becomes ever more important to really think about those supply chains. Um, Natura, I'm glad you brought up, they are a B Corp, um, they're probably the largest B Corp in Brazil. And, um, and they're an amazing example of this because they have, they've actually done an incredible job of trying to figure out how to basically formalize what was informal sector work. So they have hundreds of thousands of primarily uh, Latin American women who um, sell their products in, 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 it's sort of like Avon, but their own, their own Natura products in Latin America. Um, and they have really worked hard at trying to formalize those jobs to ensure that um, to ensure that there are real livelihoods and dignity and voice um, for uh, m what are pri primarily poor women um, in those roles. 
Um, thank you for bringing that perspective, Andrew. And with that, um, we'll hear about a solution from back home in India. And I think Liz has already given you a small preview into what the social compact is about. Um, so the social compact is actually um, talking about, um, uh, yeah, the, Shreya, are you ready? Yeah, all right. Um, so the social compact is from India. So I've just learned from Deval that you don't say Global South anymore. So I'm going to say it is from the majority. So here's a little bit about the social compact. We are a specialized public service initiative working with a special focus on informal and migrant workers. And we are one of the lead NGO partners uh, in social compact. Um, a few words about social compact. It's a unique multi-stakeholder collaboration that brings together stakeholders from the industry, um, worker organizations and experts um, into a co-solutioning relationship um, to ensure greater dignity and security for informal sector workers. So these are the temporary workers, the contract workers, or the workers engaged deep down in the supply chains that we're working with uh, through this initiative. Um, the social compact is based on a human-centric framework that outlines six major outcomes uh, where we hope to bring about a difference in the lives of these workers. So these include fair wages, safety at work sites, um, access to social protection, gender parity, um, skill upgradation, um, and linkages with critical government entitlements. Um, these outcomes were drawn from the long-standing work undertaken by Ajinka Bureau and Center for Social Justice with informal workers um, in urban and industrial areas that we all saw um, got really magnified during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Through the social compact, we use an enablement approach uh, where we help companies move forward on a journey from reflection to remedial action to ensure sustainable inclusion of worker well-being uh, in the industry ecosystems. Um, and going forward, we hope that more and more companies and stakeholders from around the world, including experts, industry associations and investors, become a part of this movement so that we can collectively drive um, an ecosystem-wide change uh, to ensure greater dignity and security for vulnerable informal workers. Thank you. It's been quite incredible to see social compact grow from an idea to its present form. Um, and given India's complex power dynamics, the positive shifts that we've seen on ground in the collaboration that exists between NGOs and industry um, has really helped several workers access better health, social protection, and um, other sorts of benefits with creches, care for uh, pregnant and uh, women, etc., at the work site. Um, so, Thank you to the panel for actually sharing uh, your perspectives with us. If we have uh, some time, maybe we can open it up to some questions or perspectives from the audience. their workforce in the TB space. Uh, we partnered uh, with the leather industry, which are into footwear making uh, in one of the cities, Agra. And what we realized very soon was that in many cases, uh, where, while the factories were compliant to the uh, global standards and all, but when it actually came to looking at whether they were following those compliances day in, day out, that was not happening. So reporting to the global, whoever is importing from them was happening. Uh, but reality was quite different. So just wanted to understand what kind of mechanisms B Corp uses to ensure compliance. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we, uh, as we were building the certification, we created a, um, a verification process. And the largest group of people who work at B Lab, as well as some partner organizations, do verification work, essentially like audits. Um, and, and there are many steps to that process because companies, as they go through the impact assessment process, that has to be verified. Then we choose randomly a percentage of the companies where we show up and do on-site visits. 
um, which include interviews with uh, workers to try to understand if there's a gap between the, com the claims companies are making about uh, how they treat their workers and what the workers are actually experiencing. Um, uh, and, then, and then I think really importantly, even that doesn't always catch everything. And so one of the most important things you can do in a process like this is you also have to have a complaints process where people can make accusations um, that you then have uh, the, the, you have to have the team that can investigate those. And I will say it's gotten, as the B Corp movement has grown um, and the brand has become more valuable, that's gotten, as you might imagine, that's gotten harder because you have more people who see an opportunity to try to take advantage of the value of the brand. And so it's gotten harder for us to do that work, um, including sometimes when we miss something and we just have to be transparent about it. But the, that verification process uh, any kind of certification, the integrity of it really relies on how good that verification process is and how transparent it is. Uh, we have to conclude right now, but you can take the conversation offline. We have some time to socialize after this. Um, I think one thing that's very clear to me from today's discussion is that uh, businesses not only have the ability, but also the resources to create change and they stand to gain from investing in worker well-being. Um, so it is important as the global environment uh, till social and governance paradigm becomes increasingly relevant in the Indian context as well. There is an urgent need for business leaders to focus on social inclusion by extending worker well-being to all workers in their ecosystem. Um, and I think that's become very clear today. Uh, thank you for the lovely conversation to the panel and I'm sorry to everybody for coughing. I think the respiration exercise that I began with maybe took a toll. <laughs>